There we go. I'm a little bit louder now. Uh, thank you, Carissa. Uh, this week, if you're a St. Mark's member, you may have received one of these letters. Dear St. Mark's family, and it mentioned a couple of words that Carissa mentioned, grace and generosity, among other things on there. It says, the Stewardship Committee thanks you for your support of St. Mark's Lutheran Church this past year. It takes all of us being generous with our time, talents, and treasures to make the church a place where we can worship, grow spiritually, and show our gratitude for God's grace. And then mentions a little bit later, a grateful heart will be generous with time, talents, and tithes. And then lastly, next Sunday it says, uh, please uh, bring your pledge card, financial pledges, as well as your time, talent, and commitment form. And we'll bring it to church next Sunday, October 1st, and we'll dedicate these to God. So it's a little bit of connection between grace and generosity. So did anybody get one of these letters, or was it just me? Oh, good. We we're all treated somewhat equally then. Yay. Yay. Uh, speaking of generosity, sometimes that's hard to do. Some people are more giving than others. Sometimes people struggle with it. I think of the, uh, the little children's book about Francis the Badger, and Francis gets a new sister, a baby sister, and she's not real happy. <laughs> she gets a baby sister. Send this baby sister badger back, please, uh, Francis. Generosity. Jealousy raises its ugly head sometimes in families, sometimes in churches. Sometimes jealousy is based on greed, that we want what they got, or we don't think it's fair that they got what we thought we would have gotten. Generosity and jealousy, or generosity and envy, seem to collide in both the gospel text today, the parable that Jesus told, as well as in the first reading from Jonah. I love the Bible story of Jonah. It's fantastic. And especially here near the end of Jonah. Jonah, this reluctant missionary, has finally done, after getting eaten by a big fish and spit back out, has finally done what God wanted Jonah to do to begin with. But Jonah, Jonah was pretty much an isolationist. He was a, not just me first, but my country first. He was an Israelite, and he wanted God just to be based in Israel. He didn't want to share that God with anybody. He didn't want to share it with the Ninevites, who in his day was basically like North Korea or Russia might be to the United States. God, don't ask me to go to North Korea to tell them that all their sins are forgiven, just turn to God and everything will be okay. Don't ask me to do that. He'd rather go on a ship somewhere else to who knows where, Tarshish maybe. And he'd rather go there than have to go where God is telling him to go. And it's not about fearing the other people. It was about fearing that God might relent from punishing the other people. Jonah said, I would rather blow up North Korea than God have you forgive them. It's a story that plays out in our daily world as well. And Jonah's worst fears were realized. God did relent from punishing. God did forgive. And Jonah sits down and pouts and says, how dare you, God? And God speaks to Jonah and comes back and says, what? Are you jealous? Are you envious? I can do what I want to do with my grace. <laughs> By the way, in the midst of Nineveh, there are 120,000 people who don't know their right from their left. In other words, it's not it was not what they did. It's because they got an evil dictator. It's because they got other problems and other issues. It's because they don't know me. And Jonah, through you, I'm hoping that they get to know me. So quit being jealous and envious of this grace that gets shared with them. And besides, there are also some animals there too. And God says, I love all the animals too. It's an interesting way of summing, summing up that scripture reading. And then, the gospel that Jesus tells about going to work. And our kids, by the way, I walked by our Sunday school classes this morning, some of the kids were enacting this story. And we had not just laborers in a vineyard, but we had people who were going out to drive race cars, and, and manicurists and pedicurists. And we had a, a young girl who was just mopping the floor. We had all sorts of great jobs that were being done downstairs. It was really cool as they enacted this parable. And they got to live out in a very short amount of time, what it might be like to be working the whole Sunday school hour, or just for the last couple of seconds of it, and then everybody got the same treat at the end. 
They seem to be all happy with it. <laughs> but imagine if you're trying to feed your family. Imagine. But that's where it kind of falls down, this gospel text today. For Jesus tells this story, and the parables are meant to blow up our thinking, to explode our thinking into some other reality. And that's what happens, because this landowner does what no landowner would do. This landowner goes and goes and goes and goes and keeps on going out to pull in people to work, not because he wants the vineyard to be the biggest and best, but because the workers need to work. The workers need some income. The landowner is more concerned with the others, those who are in need, than the landowner is concerned with himself or his farm or herself and her farm. I think the landowner in this story is God who continues to go in search of the lost, who continues to invite everybody in. And then there's a manager in the story, and the manager is the one who starts paying the people. There's no conversation between the, the owner and the man, manager in our story that says, make sure you pay people this amount. The manager just starts paying them. Maybe the manager, maybe that's Jesus, and the landowner, God, had a conversation the night before, and the landowner was concerned that some people had gotten up at 3 a.m. and had waited beginning at 4 or 5 a.m. at the place where all laborers are picked up by buses to go work in the fields to pick chilies and peppers and whatever else needs to be picked. And maybe the landowner was concerned that some people were never getting chosen because of their age, because of their physical ability or lack thereof, because of their sex because of the color of their skin because of something they were never getting chosen and maybe they just had this conversation and maybe the manager the steward took it upon himself to pay everybody equal that day maybe that would be a pretty phenomenal thing it would be like jesus not just loving people but going to the cross to die for us that jesus the manager is really the manager is willing to risk his life in order to give people the same treatment, whether they came at 5 o'clock p.m. or 5 o'clock a.m. Just an interesting thought about how that parable may be lived out. Eventually, Jesus has the words of the landowner say, Are you envious because I'm generous? Yes, I am envious, I might say, because you're generous. Because I am not usually that generous. And yes, I am envious. Yes, I'm also maybe jealous because you're generous. Maybe I'm also mad at you because I think that's unfair that everybody got paid the same. There's a whole lot of emotions that might go on in this story. But because we got this letter in the mail, one last thought about generosity today, or a couple thoughts about generosity. When we are generous with our money, with our time, usually we end up as a better person, as a better church, as a better community, as a better world. There's stories, happiness factor stories and studies, as well as generosity studies that seem to indicate that. That if Jay, if I gave Jay five dollars and told him to go buy a cup of coffee for himself, his happiness level would go from here, it might be flat or it might even go down. He'd enjoy the cup of coffee. And it was a free cup of coffee for him, but his happiness level wouldn't go up. But if I told Jay, here's five dollars, now go buy a cup, of co a cup of coffee for Ruth, the studies say that Jay's happiness level would not stay even or go down, but they would go up. Even fourfold, four times the happiness level that he started with. Four times. The same study was done all over the world in different nations, different people. The same study was done with teams. And it told a team, hey, go and just, here's... Everybody gets five bucks and just spend it on yourself. And now, team, here's five dollars that everybody gets, and go spend it on someone else on your team. And the team's not only happiness factor went up, their winning percentage went up. They were a better team because of how they shared, because of how their generosity was, both on the playing field as well as in their pro-social versus anti-social life skills together. Generosity. The landowner knows something about generosity. 
the landowner is going to benefit more and more and more people, and therefore also eventually look better in the eyes of all those people. The landowner is going to do something for himself by sharing what the landowner has with others. It's a way of thinking, what can I do to benefit other people? Our, our Project Linus people were here yesterday somewhat with that thought. God's work our hands people think oftentimes in that way. What can I do to benefit other people? The challenge is to think less about ourselves and more about others. And when we do so, we increase not only our generosity levels, but our happiness levels and team spirit, so to speak, as well. There was a story of a, a boy in Utah several months ago during the summertime who asked a, a mail carrier, do you have anything I can read? I just want something to read. I don't have any books in my home, and I don't want to watch TV or have, don't have computer stuff. And the mail carrier was blown away at this and the, gave him some old magazines and stuff, but then put on Facebook, Facebook Technology Generosity, hey, if anybody has some spare books to send to us here at the in the mail room, we will be glad to distribute those, especially to this young boy who wants to read. Books came in from all over the world, enough to establish a library. The boy says, I'm going to read them all, and I'm going to make sure everybody else gets to read them as well. We're going to share them. Free gift, generosity of books. It embedded not just that boy, but the entire community. Lastly, generally, uh, st studies say that Americans give about 2% of their income away to charity. 2%. They don't tithe. 2%, not zero. Or one, it's better than that. But it's around 2%. But there was a family named Joe and, and uh, Julia. Joe was a computer programmer. Julia was a social worker. And beginning in 2008, when their first daughter was born, and they have two daughters now, but beginning in 2000, they said, we're going to share half of our income, 50% to charity, to our church and to other causes. To date, they've given well over $500,000 since 2008, sharing half. I know that's the extreme, that's the outlier, but you ask them and they say, we, are, we have been blessed, we are a wonderful family, we are extravagant in our happiness level, and we just want to bless others with what we have received. We don't need it all. And so we continue to share, and we hope our children we hope our two daughters continue to learn and grow that generosity is just a part of life. What a wonderful statement. I believe God would echo the same. Generosity is a part of a wonderful life. The prayer that we pray today at the beginning of our worship service, I'll conclude with. The last verse especially of our prayer says, O oh Lord God, train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who is generous with His time, with His stories that challenge, even with His very life, even unto the cross. In His name we pray. Amen.